Hello, welcome. This is a conversation with Rebecca and Massimo, and we are colleagues from the University of Oregon. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a graduate with a master's. I graduated last year and Massimo is currently in the PhD program in his third year. And Massimo, if you would like to introduce and explain a little more about your focus and your studies there. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I will just start by saying that we're basically more than colleagues. We are really good friends. I mean, that that should be made public, first of all. <laughs> So that's where we met, right? I mean, we met at University of Oregon two years ago, two, two, more than two years ago, probably. So I'm a third year PhD student at the University of Oregon. And um, so University of Oregon is in Eugene, Oregon, for those who don't know. And um, yeah, uh, so my, my focus is basically in um, continental and American philosophy, more American philosophy and continental. That's what basically brought me here, you know, the chance to work on uh, stuff that I love, especially, as I just said, American philosophy. And I work, you know, primarily in the intersection and sort of, so, sort of more, you know, dialogical uh, situation between the two traditions. So American philosophy and, uh, yeah, and continental philosophy. And uh, yeah, so... That's what today is a very, you know, very rainy day here, kind of annoying, but that's Eugene. That's what they always say. <laughs> so if you come to Eugene, expect it to be very, you know, extremely rainy. So. <laughs> well, I am here in Pittsburgh and today we have some light snow on and off. Oh, cool. um, typical weather in Pittsburgh is a crapshoot. It's either predicted to be cold and it's warm or predicted to be warm and it's cold. So you never know what you're going to get in the city of Pittsburgh. Um, but that's, that's for, the quintessential, yeah, that's the quintessential philosophical problem with weather forecast, <laughs> right? They, okay. they, they want, they want to be clear. They want to predict the future, but they can't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes they get it right. <laughs> Sometimes very rarely, very rarely. <laughs> but yes, as you said, Massimo, we met at the university of Oregon over two years ago. And uh, my background is in continental philosophy and my interest lies in continental, um, though it's it's honed a little bit. You know, I, I do um, have uh, have more of an interest in concentrating on existentialism and French existentialism in particular. So that's my bent. Um, and I feel like those two, your focus with American and continental is very unique because not many Americans are aware of or understand or have been exposed to American philosophy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, but it's also true, the you know, the the same thing the other way around, I would say, because it's like there is this resistance among Europeans to uh, accept the interconnection between the two traditions and you mentioned existentialism, and it's like to me, both existentialism and phenomenology, the two great, you know, European traditions of two, in the twentieth century, are have a lot in common with American philosophy. The way I uh, understand it, the way I approach it. So it's like basically my work is in, uh, you know, not trying to isolate the two traditions, but try to bring them together. And it's like, uh, and I, I see a lot of value there, and I'm also. I also see that the the kind of trend, the general trend in, on both sides is changing, and uh, you know now European um, European scholars are becoming more and more aware of this interaction, which has you know historical um, it, it has an historical uh, ground as well. So it's not only you know something that you know you find you find two topics that go well together, you put them together, even if, you know. Uh, nobody knew about each other, right? It's mm -hmm. like, I don't, I don't like that kind of operation. But uh, in the case of American philosophy and, uh, conti and the so-called continental philosophy, I think that, the, as I said, there is a lot in common. And I, I personally love Gabriel Marcel. Uh, I still, I, I think he's, you know, I, I, I would say he's one of my favorite philosophers to, mm -hmm. uh, to a great extent from the, you know, the more existentialist tradition. And so, yeah. And that's a case of a fruitful encounter between the two because he was friend to um, William Ernest Hawking, was a uh, you know very very marginal philosophy a philosopher uh, in U.S. So nobody knows about him, I think. <laughs> yeah. But it's like he's famous. He's famous because he was interacting with Gabriel Marcel a lot, and uh, so I think that's 
that's one of the many proofs of you know a fruitful encounter between the two traditions that's slowly coming into light. Yeah. Uh, you were speaking. You had mentioned the connections between the two philo- the two philosophies, and you just mentioned one philosopher in particular that kind of that straddled that bridge. Yeah. Can you speak to any other connections or similarities or areas of convergence between the two? Yeah, there are many areas of convergence. I would say uh, right now I'm also working. No, I'm basically working on two uh, different tracks now uh, that sort of involve the same kind of situation. So now, now I'm preparing my history paper on uh, philosophy of race and uh, neo-Kantianism, which is something I've been thinking about for quite a while. Uh, you know, nobody nobody ever speaks about the neo-Kantians. Only you know a few people around the world. And here I'm talking both about U.S. and uh, Europe. So it's like uh, there are many you know scholars specialized in neo-Kantianism, but for some. Uh, Interesting historical reasons. Um, early early American philosophers were interacting a lot with with German philosophers, and that's really part of the uh, history of American philosophy. In particular, if you think that, for example, William James studied with Wilhelm Wundt in Germany, or Royce studied with Bindelband. So there's always been this kind of interaction between the two worlds um, between the end of the. Uh, 19th century and the beginning of 20th century. And so basically that's that's one track that I'm working on. So it's like neo-Kantianism and, uh, and uh, as I just said, uh, philosophy of race, in particular uh, Du Bois and Aline Locke, who I think engaged a lot uh, around the distinction between human sciences and natural sciences, meaning uh, what is it that uh, distinguishes the one from the other, right? In terms of methodologies, and that's that's the main issue there. And uh, it's also a time when you know psychology is becoming more and more important and is influencing more and more the approach of doing philosophy. And um, so that's another important element that sort of um, um, allows for uh, you know uh, for a point of, for for finding a point of convergence between the two traditions. And the second track that I'm working on is basically um, William James and Josiah Royce in connection to phenomenology. That's another uh, that's another theme that I think it's pretty um, uh, it's pretty fruitful. And um, and I also think that you know together with that I uh, I think that another huge theme in the in the history in both histories is basically how to transcend solipsism in experience. Because American philosophy is very, you know, um, at least, and this is a kind of cliche, I would say, one of the many cliches about American philosophy, that it's about individualism, right? It's about being isolated. It's not about being with society, right? And I think it's not true. And uh, there have been many attempts in the history of American philosophy to transcend the limits of the, you know, Cartesian uh, Ego cogito, right, of the isolated solipsistic experience. And that says a lot of the connection you can find between American philosophy and continental. Well, I'm interested in that, that transcendence of the isolated existence. Yeah. Because I feel like the also because, tradition- yeah, sorry if I interrupt you. Also, because we talked a lot about it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but I let's make like other people other people aware of our <laughs> yeah <interests. laughs> well the transcendence of the isolated experience is is a never ending process because we're always already alone we're always already our individual selves right and i think that the right. continental tradition uh kind of lionizes that experience you know and makes 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 every every moment every decision transcendent in itself in a way so that you're constantly in this you're in a state of perpetual transcendence within yourself and it is isolating while I think a, not an acknowledgement but an interpretation of continental as being uh, one that is is transcendent in a way that's interconnected sure sure that makes sense? Understand. yeah yeah absolutely I, I think that um, at some point in the history of, you know, Western philosophy, broadly speaking, uh, there is an awareness of the limits of the Cartesian experience. And this is something that, for example, William Ernest Hawking 
uh, treated uh, a lot, especially in his first works. But I think that the, um, that problem is already presupposed in uh, William James and uh, Josiah Royce, maybe because there were fruitful interactions between the two traditions happening uh, on both sides, but also because um, at least the, the, the major example in, uh, um, in the history of American philosophy is Ralph Waldo Emerson as an expression of the isolated experience uh, with nature, right? Um, and my, my master thesis was on Ralph Waldo Emerson, still one of my heroes. So, But certainly the early Emerson is pretty much representative of this kind of um, individualism that sort of um, resists self-transcendence the way the way you were mentioning and that makes him very similar to max stirner um who had who actually had a huge influence on on nietzsche as much as emerson i would say but uh, i think of emerson especially the early emerson as uh resisting w- without even you know consciously realizing it resisting the sort of you know self-transcendence experience that you see in um, in continental philosophy, at least if you think about uh, basically French existentialism and the way uh, you know uh, Simone de Beauvoir and Jean Paul Sartre. Uh, I always put Simone de Beauvoir first uh, and then Jean Paul Sartre because I'm much more of a, um, a Simone de Beauvoir lover, to be to, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, and and this. This, you know, it's kind of connected to her feminism too, but I still think that her way of reusing Hegelian themes is much more effective and much more important in terms of, you know, the existential weight of her thinking. And uh, so she's very pretty much representative of this, you know, self-transcendence idea. And Sartre sort of criticizes, you know, the idea of existentialism as being grounded in this idea of the individual, right? and uh, as known uh, uh, as being proper to itself, right? So c- kind of resisting any, any connection with society. But to, to, to a great extent, the same kind of, uh, you know, themes are uh, present in American philosophy in, in a different manner, for sure. But it's like, uh, it's pretty, you, you see that, for example, in the tension between William James and Josiah Royce, and Josiah Royce is much more of a, you know, sort of community philosopher, while uh, William James is much more of the um, philosopher that puts, you know, more emphasis on the individual. But then what happens is that he's at the same time critical of solipsism. And we see mm-hmm. that many, um, many, you know, many of his works, for example, we, we see that in his notes, in his early notes on solipsism and uh, where, where he's elaborating his first form of uh, radical empiricism. We see that in the essays in radical empiricism, where he talks about the coterminousness of two minds into one object. So it's like two minds perceive the same kind of object, right? And that's already an attempt of overcoming solipsism in itself. And uh, so it's like, uh, but I would say that, you know, at some point, even Ralph Waldo Emerson realizes the uh, limits of that, uh, you know, strict individualistic position. And uh, in in a work like uh, Society and Solitude is trying to, uh, you know, integrate the two dimensions together, right? You have Mm -hmm. solitude as much as society. The problem is how you... um, can have a sort of authentic experience of both, which is, which I think is another problem, right? Well, you have solitude as much as society. So let's, let's put that in a framework of our 21st century pandemic that we've been living in. (laughs) How do we have, how do we have solitude in society or how do we have society in the solitude in which we found ourselves wittingly or unwittingly? Um, how do we make sense of the fact that we are still part of, in one of our earlier discussions, we talked about, you know, the commodification of labor and how that, what that looks like presently. How do we, how do we come together as a workforce? Is there a workforce? Are we not just individuals working in some particular field or aspect? Like, how does that, how does that look? How does that work or cohere with? Sure. You know what? In terms of society and solitude, this being 
opposite to each other, but opposite that sometimes come together. Um, the problem is authenticity there. So um, you're being authentic in as much as you are experiencing uh, society and solitude according to your will and according to your necessity in a way. So I'm being with society because I want to be with society. And that makes that experience authentic. What happened with the pandemic, I think that it's like this sort of opposites are become forced, became forced in a way, right? Because it's like, because there is a pandemic, you don't, you are put in a situation where you are put into solitude without, you know, what really wanting to be in solitude. Because at, at least this is the way I uh, I feel the, um, uh, the this entire situation. Now it's a little bit different, but when the pandemic, the whole pandemic started, at least this, this was my you know immediate reaction to it, that I was feeling forced, being forced into solitude, mm -hmm. and and at the same time being forced into society. Right? It's like mm -hmm. so you are experiencing society, you are co-experiencing society with other people, but in this in a manner that doesn't doesn't make it feel natural. Right. Mm -hmm. And the same thing on the side of the other opposite. Right. Um, uh, solitude. Right. You're working, from, you know, in your home and uh, and it's like and I've always been, you know, uh, a lover of solitude when working. I always like the idea, you know, of reading books on my own, uh, you know, at my place and, uh, you know, enjoying uh, uh, when possible, you know, the writing process, because it's not always <laughs> possible because it's like you have deadlines that you have stuff that you have to complete according to deadlines. And it's like you have to work at cer a certain point that takes uh, a little bit of the pleasure of, uh, you know, exploring uh, things through the readings of books and, uh, you know, and the writing process that goes with it. I would say that it's like the, the major problem there in terms of the pandemic is the really the problem since we began, you know, discussing about um, existentialism is really the problem of authenticity there. And it's like we're still we still haven't reached the point where these two opposite come together authentically because we have restrictions. Right. Mm -hmm. And this two op the experience of these two opposites come in. Um, in a very in a very forced manner to some extent maybe today is a little bit better i don't know what you what you think about it because it's like that's my that's my general feeling about this entire situation well i well i'm kind of stuck on something that you said a little bit earlier was we were forced into solitude and then we were forced into the public and i think when you said forced into being in the public or forced to be in the public or with the public um that really struck me because I, as you said, as you do, I love solitude. I love working alone, reading alone, being in my my bubble of interests, whatever that may be at the moment. And then being forced into this solitude, being, you know, said you can't go to these public places because it's dangerous. Your life is at risk. You have to stay isolated. But then to sustain the life in isolation, I'm forced to engage with the public. So it just seems it was a very disingenuous experience at the beginning of this. And it, that carried, for me personally, it carries into the present because I still feel this forced engagement with the other, with the, the public in general, because I'm not at all comfortable with, with being around other people because I know that not everybody um, is as careful or considerate about their sure. health and the health sure. of others. So I have this very disingenuous sense of in interacting and engagement and everything just feels so um, ephemeral. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you know, within yourself that it's not going to last forever, but it's still lasting. Right. So it, it's like you have to deal with it in a way that sort of uh, detaches you from uh, um, from what it really is from a you know, it, it, it is a forced situation. So it's like you're wearing a mask. And this is not to say that I'm <laughs> no wax guy, certainly not. But it's like, um, because this, you know, the entire vaccination thing has to do with another, you know, huge problem, which is that of responsibility, right? Um, responsibility as a universal, as a universal value. So you're doing it for yourself, or you're also doing it for other people because you are responsible. Um but, uh, you know, even with that, you have uh, things that don't come natural 
right? In terms of both society and solitude. And uh, um, and you're, you're trying to get used to that in a way that could make you feel as if it was natural, but it's not natural, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like, so you go to, you go to a restaurant, you're wearing a mask, then you sit at the table and it's like in some, in some, uh, uh, you know, bars in, here in Eugene, especially downtown bars, you were, uh, they're expecting you to have the vaccination card, mm-hmm. for example. And that's totally understandable. Um, but it's like, again, uh, it's, it's like, you know, going, th- going through checkpoint, Charlie, <laughs> Mm-hmm. you're moving you know you're moving from society to solitude and then uh, you know using a sort of the, there is a border between the two and uh you know you have to overcome those borders but those borders are still present right so it's like so the pandemic created created those borders mm-hmm. and again i'm not saying this as a sort of you know way of criticizing uh you know the the vaccines or anything like that. I mean, because I wonder if we really have any other solution except, you know, vaccines at this point. Mm-hmm. But it's like, it's obvious that this, uh, the, the pandemic also had, uh, you know, a, a huge impact on uh, on the, on th- really on the ontology of social relations, right? So what's happening at, at a concrete level, so at, at an ontological level in terms of how human interactions work, and it's like not not only through the opposites of society and solitude, also for that which comes between them, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't know how you feel about that. It's like maybe I'm. <laughs> well, I would say over the weekend, just yesterday, I met with my mother, and we went to a shopping mall. Mm-hmm. And I can't remember the last time I was at a shopping mall, even before the pandemic. So this was an entire. I felt as if it was my first time ever in a shopping mall, in a crowd, in a place where others were just free to move about as they saw fit. And the, um, I was in a mask, my mother was in a mask and I was so, so tense the entire time. You know, nobody checked my vaccination status or asked for a card before entry, before being admitted to a, a, a store or anything. But just the fact that I had this mask on and there were, there were others that wore masks, but the majority did not. Uh, I just felt, okay. I felt this barrier and, right. and that this impediment to even a moderate amount of engagement with the people around me. I just felt so isolated in this public sphere. It was, it was, it was very, it was alarming. It was very yeah. alarming. But also, you know, uh, and th- this goes with, uh, you know, our major existentialist theme uh, the, the, the problem of an embodied experience there, um, because it's like this, I was, I was, you know, putting it into terms of an ontological problem and what goes with it is also, you know, uh, that you avoid hugging other people, you avoid, you know, the, the normal, uh, experience of corporate that would normally happen on an everyday basis. It's like when you shake hands, when you, and and it's like that is also part of meeting meeting the other mm-hmm. meeting otherness right because our uh, it's it's not only a product of words and um you know of language of of simple you know linguistic human interaction is also something that happens at the level of corporate that is uh that is excluded right right now right you do it i mean you hug a person you know really well who you know has been vaccinated and you know doesn't have covid you know you yeah. know that yeah. so but you you're doing it on condition that the person uh could not infect you right mm-hmm. so it's like uh that that also created a huge change right in the way we you know interact at the more corporeal sort of level right and that and that's another you know consequence of this you know you know, great, really ontology of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. The experience any, any better crazy. word there? And it's like, and what you were describing is also reminiscent of, of the problem of uh, responsibility there. And it's like, so to what extent are you um, okay about um, renouncing to some of your personal freedom to uh, for the safety of society? That's the other, that's the other thing. Because another another thing that came to my mind when the when the, the whole pandemic started, 
and it's like I, I really had conflicting uh, ideas there. So I want to be free, but at the same time, I I know I have responsibilities. And we're talking about the time when you know the vaccination was was still something you know an idea very very pre- pretty remote at the time. But it's like for me, it was like I don't want to renounce to my freedom. So I know that I wanna uh, you know I wanna experience nature. I wanna experience otherness, right? I wanna keep my solitude, but at the same time, I wanna keep society, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like yeah. So that's the basic. Um, that's the basic feeling that I that I had, but really, yeah. So the situation is like you know the the shopping mall as a as a representative of the normal you know society experience, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Which was pretty normal right before the pandemic, and it's like. But again, the first thing you notice is I'm wearing a mask, but other people are not wearing masks. So um, it's like there there is a problem there. I mean. Why, I mean, is a responsibility at this point, you know, a universal value or is it just, you know, something that, uh, you know, uh, a small amount of people um, care about or not? Yeah. So, like, hu- huge problems there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And I was thinking about, you know, the the people, you know, we were talking about the commodic- commodification of labor and especially during the pandemic, um, like, what is, what is the embodied experience of someone who was forced to work through the pandemic fully engaged with people like frontline workers, hospital workers, doctors, emergency medical services, child care workers. You know, I worked for a short period with two-year-olds and it was terrifying. Sure. Because there was a COVID expo outbreak during the time that I worked with them. I had to quarantine and these are two-year-olds. Like I didn't want to touch them because sure. you know, there's that chance that I may be carrying a latent virus and I could pass it on to them even though I whatever, regardless of my vaccination status, you know, sure. I could pass it on to them even if I have a mask on and wash my hands compulsively throughout the day. Or that they could pass it to me and put my health and life at risk. And it was just you know, at, at what cost do we deserve, at what cost do we put ourselves in these situations? What is, what is expected of us? Like what kind of, what kind of loyalty or integrity are we supposed to have when confronted with this situation? And when I say integrity, I mean, I'm referencing the work from home sure. here. I mean, how can we have any integrity? How can we have any coherence as, as employees of an employer? That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, and not all jobs are the same there, right? Yeah. I mean, um, it's horrible. The, uh, I mean, the, the Zoom teaching, I had that experience for quite a while now. Now we, we finally went back to, you know, normal, uh, you know, in-person teaching. There is always tension there because it's like, um, so 90 plus percent of the students have been vaccinated, so you shouldn't worry about it. But it's still, you know, you, you still feel that there is tension there. And it is important in my job to, uh, you know, have that interaction uh, and keep that authentic Mm -hmm. Uh, because otherwise I don't really understand what's happening in uh, students' minds. Not that I can read students' minds, but it's like you, (laughs) when you are teaching and, uh, you know, real, real, not virtual people are there, you feel, uh, you feel everything different, even, uh, um, you realize something that you don't realize through Zoom that is the response to what you are saying. So to what extent uh, students understand what you're saying. And this is something that you completely lose through Zoom. Even if you see faces, even if you see, uh, you know, expressions and reactions, but so for some reason, and that that's probably what makes us human in, in terms of, you know, how that reflects human interactions is this idea of having someone there, Right. That the virtuality of experience of uh, you know of Zoom or Facebook or social networks cannot really restitute in any in any kind of way, so that's one thing. But as through through the job I do, I could also think about a possible situation, right? And you know, be at home and using you know use Zoom, and that that would perfectly work, right? But uh, nurses, for example, uh, you know, uh, people working in hospitals don't don't have that. I mean, and because 
that that sort of job is grounded in uh, uh, in a truly embodied experience that cannot be substituted by other mediums. And it's like so not all jobs are the same in that sense. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You cannot you cannot really find a substitution there through uh, um, through Zoom unless you are, um, you know, a doctor, some kind of a general doctor and you have your patients through Zoom. But at the same time, I mean, that it's not that it's not a perfect situation because, again, that has to do with real, authentic human interaction. So if it's not happening, it can still be an effective communication, but there is something missing. Yeah. And that's something missing is, I think, uh, bodily expression and not only bodily expressions is how it feels to be with another person in real, in real life. Yeah. Um, you know, my first teaching experience was on Zoom and yeah, I, I can understand what you're saying, you know, for this, for the students that had their cameras on. It was hard to tell if anything piqued their interest, um, yeah. which is different than being in front of a classroom, which unfortunately I've never been, but you can maybe relate. Well, you can relate. Um, you know, when you say something that you're excited about and you, you get excited about it and you can see, you know, even a change or an adjustment in a chair so a student can see better or, you know, twiddling their pencil a little faster because they're interested. You know, it's those little, those minutia of interaction that really sure. um, ground the interrelation with the world in experience, right? Yeah. And uh, I have this, uh, I remember this situation, right? They they had all their screens off, right? Completely switched off. And I would talk to them, but it was like talking to me, <laughs> right? And at some point I would get, are you all there? Are you okay? And I would get, you know, the yellow hand, the, the okay yellow hand. Yes. That is like, okay, thank you very much, guys. But I need, you know, I need something else. In a real situation, it would have been like, uh, I know you guys are listening to me because I feel it. Mm. Right? It's that it's that you know primordial human interaction that is 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 not even up at the level of visible experience that I'm seeing expressions. Mm -hmm. Is that I feel it, and it's yeah. something that it's hard to to you know uh, to describe. And I think it, it's in our job, but also in other in other jobs, right? That involve some kind of human interaction, right. authentic human interaction. I mean, so if you um, if you try to substitute that through the use of other mediums like like Zoom, you're still working, but it's not an authentic work because it's not grounded in uh, an actual human experience that happens through, uh, you know, it, it, that happens in visibility, that happens in incorporated to. And the fact that you are substituting that through another medium is, is problematic. It's certainly a consequence of the pandemic. And uh, so thank God, even if I'm not a technology guy, thank God we still have that because it's still people can, you know, work, do some kind of work. But that creates um, that creates a, a detachment that creates, a, uh, you know, a really an, a, an exasperation of the two opposites of society and solitude such that, you know, to go back to our initial idea so that um, none of them are authentic. Yes, yes. Um, I have a situation where I'm working from home and I've, I've met my coworkers virtually on zoom meetings and I have, I have interactions with them through different messaging uh, platforms throughout the day, but I have no, no authentic engagement with them. I feel no, no connectedness to anybody in my department or on my team, because I, I, I don't know what, I, I can't tell what their reactions are. You know, and whether you have a screen on a camera on or not, it's still it's still very disenfranchising as a as a human involved in this group effort as an employee, as a woman, as um, as an individual in the world. It's very disenfranchising. However, I will say that as as a woman in this dynamic, I feel more empowered than I ever have. That's interesting. Yeah, I feel I feel definitely more empowered. And of course, I'm going to call upon my one of my favorite philosophers, Helene Sixou, and you know, yeah. her laugh of Medusa, woman must write herself. And I I think about that every day. And I think about the challenge that that posits. And I think about that when I'm engaging with my coworkers on these interactions where 
you know, I have to make myself heard, whether it's, you know, what time a report has to be in by or who's going to do the next report or whatever the topic may be. I feel like I have an obligation to um, my personhood and my my femaleness. I see and that. I don't like that word, but my, my you know, my, my, my female nature to assert myself and to and to write myself into the into the the, the dialogue. Yeah. And, and I let me pose qualms no about that at all. Yeah. Let me pose this question to you now. So it's like do you, you think that the pandemic and the use of technology contributed to that, to something that otherwise it would it wouldn't be possible? Yes. Yes, I do. Oh. And this is something um that I have been thinking about. I feel more empowered because I'm in my own space and I have a I modicum of control over what happens in my personal and private space. My body is not does not have the potential to be victimized I or rejectified. You know, all you get is this. Right, right. And um I can turn it off. I have the power to turn it off. I don't even have to share that. So I, I feel that it's done I mean, it's really made me feel really empowered. I see. Yeah, yeah. And it's 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 a very natural thing. I mean, I I, I really don't think about this nuance and um because I'm normally pretty um you know critical of technologies in general, because for me the main problem there is the the problem, you know, the existentialist problem of authenticity. Um and it's like, so does that give you, you know, an authentic experience? At the same time, I also realized that the implementation of these kinds of technology uh, helped some people, right? Because it's like, it's not an authentic human interaction, but at least the people who are, you know, more shy or have problems, you know, being in more social situations can use technology in order to, uh, you know, engage and interact with other people. So it's like, I don't really want to, uh, you know, <laughs> um, appear as a, you know, as totally anti, anti-technology guy, primarily because we are doing this entire thing through technology. So otherwise right. there wouldn't be any, any podcast, you know, of us talking to each other. So it's like, like, let's take, let's also have a look at the positive side. And as you mentioned, it, it's like, it also, uh, protects you. Mm -hmm. Right. So it, it also cre creates a protective space but allowing for interaction at the same time. So it's a sort of combination of protection and, um, and interaction, mm -hmm. right? That, it, that it's like that, that, that it's happening there and it's not, yeah. And it's not bad at all. Right. Yeah. And, and now that I think more about it, you know, when I go out, I feel completely, uh, cowed almost mm -hmm. in the public sphere because I have to have protection against, from the objectification of my my presentation of my my body of who i am of my health status you know i have to i have to keep everything guarded and protected and shielded you know at the grocery store i make sure that i have the grocery cart behind me so nobody gets too close any sure. you know, in any in any way and it's just um i feel much more free as a as a woman working from a distance and having this technological protection to telecommute, I don't know. Yeah, and you know, there is a, I would say that there is also tension there because it's like it's protection, but at the same time, it isolates you, right? I mean, in this sense, it becomes protective, the, the way you are expressing it, but at the same time, it's like, it's also responsible for, uh, you know, some sort of isolation um, too, that yeah. it's like. Yeah, it's definitely enhancing my my sense of isolation and my tendency outside of the pandemic to isolate. Yeah. So there's there's a balancing act with that. And I and I'm I just wonder how long before this this setup makes me feel just even disenfranchised kind of maybe for myself, you know, like I, I don't know. I have a hard time. I don't know. I have a hard time delineating where I stop and where work begins. What is personal interest? What is work interest? Things like that. Maybe that's just because of my, my nature, my work ethic anyway. But um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just worried about like the power, the, the invisible power dynamic that this, this disenfranchised working has over me as an individual. Yeah. And, it, and, and it's like, I would say that it's also, this has also to do with the means and ends distinction, mm -hmm. right? I mean, uh, um, when this thing becomes an end in itself, 
it's it's really problematic as long as it is a means for uh you know keep things going mm-hmm. in work it's still it was i would say it's still kind of okay and uh, acceptable but when it becomes an end in itself implying that uh it's like everything is governed by technology and um and technology becomes the surrogate for any kind of, of interaction any kind of balance between society and solitude mm-hmm. uh, where where we started right and that that to me becomes highly problematic because i, I also see a tendency to um you know use use technology as a substitute as a substitution for things that otherwise wouldn't happen mm-hmm. right because of you know of personal difficulties in doing it and i'm not a person who thinks that you know society the society experience should be forced onto people because otherwise it wouldn't be authentic right but at the same time you gain so much more from uh, from human interaction but you also get the bad part of it you know that being exposed to uh you know um to problems that happen in physicality that happen in embodied experience but at the same time when you lose that it's like it's to me is very is very problematic i don't know what you think about it but you know when we lose the embodied experience yes i yeah, agree yeah. you know important. it's like that's that's part of you know the society and solitude thing right i mean that that uh, the embodied the embodied experience the physicality of of going places and being with uh, with other people just fleshes out or fills out the the transcendent experience one's ontological experience it just it completes the human experience in a way that working or living communicating interacting virtually just simply cannot i mean whatever whatever vulnerability or whatever vulnerability may happen as a result or you may encounter as a result of being physically the corporal engagement with the world um i think is irreplaceable i mean because that vulnerability also informs your experience and it's something from which you can learn and grow and develop and enhance your lived experience. So I I think it's integral and I'm, I'm just, I'm very doubtful about um, how sustainable the work from home paradigm is in the long term. which I think for many companies and businesses, it will be because it's, it's just more cost effective than to have a brick and mortar place. So I'm just concerned about the sustainability of being a human in the world while working from home for you know, people in that situation. Yeah. And also, also the fact that, and this is very, you know, um, very everyday experience, like, so you get up, um, and all you see is your house is your place, which is great. You have your things, you have your records, you have your books, you have your television, you have everything you want. But at the same time, uh, it's like, maybe the fact that you go away from home and you go to some other place, and by that, I mean, if, if you live in a, in a city that allows you not to be, you know, 24 hour in the traffic, because that's another, that's another issue. I mean, my city, I, I was born near Rome and, uh, and it's like, so for me, the idea of, you know, the workplace being, you know, near to where you live is like, uh, you know, I was blessed. Finally, it's like someone, God gave to me, you know, the, the chance to go to a workplace by, by walk. Just yeah. something that I've never experienced when I was, a, you know, an MA student and uh, when I was in Rome. And um, so I'm really glad that I'm in this situation where I can, you know, go to the workplace. And it's like for me, uh, the, the reason why I say this is it's because I think it is also important to have a break between, uh, you know, your life in your place and the life in, uh, you know, in a workplace that's distinct from your place. And I think that's... Um, Maybe that does not apply to anyone. It only applies to me to, to a great extent. But I think that it's important to also have a break between the, the two the two things. So the space you um, you live as a you know as a space that it's you know uh, that, that that's a space where you don't work, but you have you know you spend the rest of your day that that doesn't you know belong to the uh, to the work experience. Mm-hmm. Right. And the work experience that happens in a, in a place that's different from that. So I think that, you know, as a consequence of the pandemic, we also lost that, that sort of experience, which 
I mean, from from the standpoint of the um, um, of the people, um, you know, of, of, of basically of your of your. Um, for example, let me let me let me take it this way. Let me put it. <laughs> let me make it easier. Um, so the the the. the the employers, right? I mean, it's cost effective and it's totally fine, but it's not, uh, it, you lose a lot as an employer, as an employee, sorry, in that, through that, I think, in terms, in terms of human experience. Yes. Yes, you do. Uh, but I feel like it's trading experience for free, for personal freedom in a way. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's trading, you're trading everyday interactions like taking the bus or walking, you know, a half a mile to get to work or whatever um, your experience is for the fact that you're free, more or less, to do whatever you like throughout the day. Yes, you're working, but you still, you know, if you need to go get a drink, it's just, you know, a couple feet this way or a couple feet that way. You don't have you don't have the constraints of, you know, the pressures of walking in an office. Like if you're in a cubicle situation, you know, you have to walk. Oh, I don't want to I don't want to go get a cup of coffee because I know if I go there, I'll have to engage with this person or that person. And yeah, you don't yeah. have that pressure, <laughs> but you you have you yeah, have, absolutely. You have the ease and freedom to to kind of recreate on your own, even though you're working. Yeah, you don't choose your colleagues, right? Yeah, <laughs> you are being with colleagues, and uh, you know, it's like it's not it's not great. But even at that level, I, I think it's still more vital, more you know, more natural than just you know, um, you know, being on your own your place and uh, you know, working from home. Um, so it really depends at, at that at that point it really depends on the person if you are a person who still like uh, likes to or, you know to be with other people uh, and working with other people it's it's totally fine if you are a person who doesn't you know really like to be with people maybe working working at your place working from your home it's so much better but even with that you need some kind as i said some kind of human interaction so that maybe goes beyond work the work situation but it's like you want uh for example you know see a friend uh you know hang out with your partner and go to you know go to a brewery and have a beer for example now we have that fortunately but when the pandemic started it, we didn't have that right we were supposed to you know go to the grocery uh, get a bottle of wine, get a beer, and then uh, maybe, you know, meet with other people on Zoom mm -hmm. and having, you know, an artificial, uh, you know, uh, yeah, an, uh, you know, an artificial sort of pub situation. Right, right. <laughs> and that wasn't great. And he's like, what are you drinking? I'm drinking this bottle of wine. What are you drinking? I'm drinking this beer. Oh, that's very interesting. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, it's, you know, that's crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I don't I don't know. I think, yeah. I think we covered about all of our bases. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I hope that who will listen to to this podcast won't be annoyed by our by our, you know, overly philosophical, you know, approach to the pandemic problem. <laughs> what other ways there are two approaches? Yeah, but, but we sh we shared we shared experiences around it. So, we did our job. <laughs> I would say. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for taking the thank time you. to speak with us to speak today and talk about these things and um we can talk again soon yeah yeah i hope so yeah i really had a great time so yeah okay let's do other philosophical experiments okay <laughs> we'll do we'll thank, you. Yeah. Thank, thank you thank you very much <laughs>